Hi guys, it's Sophie. So we're going to be doing my next Around the World wrap up. Uh, we are going to be going from Liechtenstein to Slovenia today. So still in Europe, um, a lot of microstates in this one. Um, these are three microstates, so it's going to be a fairly quick video because three of the countries are in this book. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about today is Liechtenstein. So very similar to Andorra, Liechtenstein is really a nation apart from anything else. Um, it is again tiny um, and is separate from a lot of world affairs. They managed to keep themselves out of a lot of trouble um, and in that way have gathered a good deal of wealth. Um, Liechtenstein, probably all of the microstates, is the most like fairy tale like I would say in terms of um, isolated kingdoms and the idea of a family ruling over a people, so very much that kind of old idea of leadership. Um, Liechtenstein is also, as per this book anyway, um, the wealthiest um, country per capita, so um, I'm sure you know what that means. Um, and it used to be Monaco, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, but that was overtaken in 2008. Yeah. Um, so Liechtenstein has a number of really big banks in it, um, lots of finance goes on. They, often these microstates seem to be kind of tax havens um, and play places for the really wealthy. Um, the other thing that's quite interesting about Liechtenstein is that they run an institute of self determination, which is what they uh, feel is. Um, their key to success and they kind of teach and um, explore ideas of self-determination um, around their country and what they've learnt with all these other countries. Um, Liechtenstein has fairly good relations with everyone else in Europe and um, is kind of protecting itself I think um, amongst that, that sort of um, desire for everything to kind of dissolve into one big state. So yeah, Liechtenstein was one that I didn't know anything about at all. I'd, I'd learned a little bit about Andorra last time purely because I found it so hard to find a book for Andorra, um, but Liechtenstein I didn't know anything about until I read about it. Next we have San Marino, um, which is a really, again, really small microstate, um, I think it's about 26 square miles, um, and it's attached to Italy. Um, San Marino is quite interesting because um, it actually formed as a kind of safe uh, conclave for early Christians. Um, when the Romans were trying to um, sort of cease Christianity's influence in Europe um, and they went and hid in this mountain town and the community, the Christian community that was established in um, San Marino actually is older than the papacy so I think that was quite a cool um, little fact. Um, they currently are working um, with other sort of members of um, the European Union to try and reduce the amount of tax evasion that does go on in microstates um, because they act as these kind of self entities. Often they are rich enough that they don't actually need to charge tax to their residents. Um, so yeah, they they do they are trying to um, prevent people from setting up businesses there just for the uh, purposes of evading tax. Um, there was one other thing about San Marino that I wanted to let you guys know about. Well, I've forgotten what it is. Give me one sec. Yeah, so it was about Napoleon, um, which I found quite interesting because you realise how big of an impact he had on like the formation of Europe when you read about the microstates. Um, but basically, the reason why Napoleon left San Marino alone and didn't um, take it in with, as he did with a lot of other small states, um, is because the leaders came to him and spoke to him and said that they felt that San Marino was um, modelled on the idea of a perfect Rome and, and Napoleon was obsessed with that idea of like a perfect state um, and actually was so like enamoured by the idea and by the leader that he then said that they could keep their state because he was interested to see how it went um, which again I just think is a really cool little factoid. And the last microstate I have to talk about is Monaco. So I think everyone knows Monaco for the casino, that's the only thing I knew about it and that it's like a little place where famous people go. Um, the story behind the casino is one of the like most interesting stories. In fact, Monaco is bloody interesting. Um, but the reason why there's even a casino there and why this like mountain top little casino is so popular is um, basically the the I think it's really tiny as well. Let me just find out if I can see exactly how tiny it is. Yeah, it's only two square kilometers. So it's absolutely tiny. Um, it used to be that they had um, below the, the mountainous elements these flat um, sort of pastoral lands where people would farm and um, that was how they produced most of the income for the, the tiny, teeny tiny little place was through selling and trading um, the things that they grew. Um, however, the land was lost to the country and it was um, subsumed into other countries and they ended up with basically a 
a set of land that could produce nothing. Um, and the leaders kind of got their heads together and thought, how can we find something that doesn't take up space but can produce enough money to keep a group of people alive? And they decided that they were going to make this luxury casino. So that is where the casino came from, which I think is really cool as an idea. Um, a lot of the characters who are kind of in the history of Marco, um, yeah, just sound awesome. Like, okay, so there's um, a woman called Antoinette um, who was one of the princesses um, and she was banished uh, by her sister. Um, to prevent her from um, getting the throne. And she moved down the road and became a grand dame au chat, adopting stray felines from all around the neighbourhood. And she was eventually reconciled with the family when she was 90 years old. But so she basically just moved out and gathered loads of stray cats, which I think is wonderful. Um, okay, in 1992, a woman from California filed a paternity seat against Albert, who was another one of the prince, to say that he'd fathered enough of her children, and he in fact did. Um, but they are illegitimate children and therefore can't um, gain the throne. Um, but they just kind of go all over the place and just kind of make messes. Um, and just, I don't know, it's just the kind of thing where you, you just feel like, what are you all doing? But yeah, um, it says that it has um, the most expensive real estate in the world um, at $56,000 per square metre. And it's the most densely populated of all countries. So yeah, that is all of the microstates, um, just little snippets really. As I say, there's not too much to go into here, um, but it was interesting to learn about some places I knew nothing about before. And next we have my pick for Italy. by Simona Vinci and this one was translated by Minna Proctor. I don't really know how to talk about this book to be perfectly honest. Um, I think this is probably like the most, the darkest, most out there book that I've ever read um, and actually I don't know whether or not I think it should have even been like published. Um, how can I kind of explain it without like destroying my YouTube? Like. Um, it's essentially about a group of children who uh, build themselves this safe little kind of enclave and clubhouse almost um, to just be kids. They bring all their favourite toys, they kind of um, build it up and they're kind of from like 8 and 9 up to 15, 16. Um, and one day one of the older boys brings in a cachet of porn into the um, clubhouse and the children begin to explore sexuality um, as a group with some really really disastrous consequences. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I I don't, I kind of wish I hadn't read it to be honest. Um, I did finish it um, and I can understand why it caused such a fuss in Italy when it was published. Um, it's, it's all but disappeared from what I can see in terms of um, I picked this one up in a used book, book sale, um, right near the beginning of Around the World actually and I was just kind of at the stage where I still had loads of things I could pick up and I was like oh my god there's one from Italy I'll grab it, um, but I think this might even be out of print now, um, yeah I don't know what the fate of this book is, uh, I'm not going to forget it, but yeah I, I do kind of wish I hadn't read it unfortunately, um, yeah really really dark, really dark guys. And then finally I have my pick for Slovenia. So I read The Tree With No Name by Drago Jankar for my pick for Slovenia and that was translated by Michael Biggins. This book was not what I expected when I first started reading it. So if you've watched my vlog of me and Foster doing very little, you'll see that it was quite funny to start with and quite light. Um, this is a really, really heavy book, but it does it like the tale of the frog that you put into the cold water on the stove. Um, as you keep reading, and it's actually, whilst it is under 300 pages, um, the writing is small and the pages are big and I think if this was in like a standard paperback size this would probably be like a 450 page book. Um, throughout the book you lose more and more of the kind of light in, in life and the, the things at the very beginning seem quite flippant and kind of jokey. Um, you could you begin to understand like the reality behind those things. Um, this is a book that 
in essence uh, follows two kind of paths um, somewhat simultaneously. So um, our main character is someone who works as an archivist in um, a city in Slovenia and his main job is to try and reconcile um, lost property and lost um, assets um, to people that were stripped of them during World War Two. So he's trying to ensure that people who had all of their things stolen from them essentially get some of that back. Uh, and he does that by looking back at the property rights and things. Um, but one day he stumbles across a story about a young woman who um, was beaten, raped and um, had her head shaved in the woods and he thinks he might have known this woman um, when she was a young, younger woman. And he kind of becomes obsessed with finding out whether or not the woman who this happened to was someone he knew um, and what happened in that life and what led up to that um, and we follow the life of this woman through um, kind of the horrors of um, concentration camps and World War II um, because of the way that he's drawn to her. Um, I actually would recommend this. I think I'd recommend this if you want a really, really like honest look at um, how other how countries other than just like Germany and the UK were affected in World War Two. Because um, I think it's easy to forget <laughs> um, because of the way that, especially in the UK, things are taught in schools that it's it was like such a global thing and that there were pockets of awfulness and all different varieties going on all over the world so um, this particularly focuses on the rift between uh, Slovenian people so it's a country that's fairly well split in terms of religious lines and allegiances um, and it meant that um, in World War II it was like neighbour against neighbour um, and it wasn't necessarily um, like religiously religious background motivated it could just be like a social thing um but yeah so it was really difficult to read um it took me quite a long time to read um despite being a fairly short one just because it was such a heavy subject matter um and there are two or three scenes in here that i will remember for the rest of my life i think um because they are just so stark and there's little details that um feel so real um, yeah, so I would, I would recommend this one, um, but to a very certain kind of reader, I guess. Um, the author was, I think, exiled from Slovenia for his writing, um, and I don't know where he is now, but I'm pretty sure that he um, was either, either his books were banned or he was exiled um, for what he wrote about. Um, so yeah, I think you should pick this one up if you're interested in it, but I completely understand if not. Um, I'm really glad I read it because it was something that I didn't know anything about at all and I actually think it is of all of the documentaries and podcasts and everything that I've read about World War II like the most honest raw depiction of concentration camps um which is obviously like a really dark topic but you know we need to go and learn about things sometimes. So those have been the next five books of my Reading Around the World challenge um, I know the lighting's been a bit weird in this video, um, there is no natural lighting at all today so I am very very washed out by my artificial lights, um, just trying to make sure you can see me. Uh, and this side is not quite as bright because we don't have any blog circuits over there. Hopefully that's been okay, um, thank you guys for watching and commenting and just being engaged with this um, challenge. Um, I'm trekking on through my next five books at the moment, um, yeah so I will probably come back to you next week or midway through next week uh, with my next wrap up. I'll chat to you guys then. Bye!